thank you everyone um for coming um thank you so much to the dance cult for having me um really excited to be here um and excited to kind of share this project with you um my name's jack mcneil i am an associate lecturer at the university of york in the uk uh, and my research is generally practice led. So I'm a sound artist and composer, and I generally look at the club as a site of critical investigation. Um, but I also look at analyzing club spaces and culture through the lens of the visual arts. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about site making in club cultures and creative strategies for building club spaces online. Um, so, this is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and I'm, this, this project is essentially based on some online responses to the club closures at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020. Um, I'll be doing this by looking at a few specific case studies that came about at the start of the pandemic that responded to this absence of physical club spaces, providing surrogate spaces for participants, and particularly those who regularly engage and identify with nightlife culture. And the three that I'm gonna be looking at are United We Stream, uh, Club Quarantine and Sinkers Club. And I'll talk a bit more about what those are and what they do a bit later on. Um, but specifically, I propose that the sites are produced as the result of a creative process of site making and the construction of which I'll frame um, through the artistic practices of site specificity and the consideration of participants as material, uh, which I'll refer to as um, relational practices. So in other words, by examining these practices in relation to club space, I'm gonna be looking at how the construction of physical and social spaces are two key elements to site making. Um, and before I continue, I should say this is a real overview. I could go into these theories in a lot more detail. This is a kind of overview of this research um, and how it might impact um, the future of kind of in situ and virtual nightlife as well. Um, very quickly, before giving a background on these artistic theories uh, and their relationship to the club and club cultures as well, um, I'd like to quickly clarify two quite important suppositions for this work. Um, so firstly, uh, as is often suggested, I'm looking at the club as an art space. So I'm looking at it as a space for performance, um, an architectural space, a space full of visual stimuli, and of course, music. And we'll talk more about these things a bit later on. Um, secondly, throughout the presentation, I'm going to differentiate between space as a place with very specific architectural, locational, or design characteristics, and a site as a place that may have these characteristics, but could also exist outside of the boundaries of the physical space. So those are kind of two distinctions that I'm making here. Okay, let's dig a little deeper. Um, so club sites, as we know them, generally exist within these physical boundaries. They're punctuated by physical architectural design features, and they could be a building, a temporary event, or a festival, like an illegal rave or something like that. Um, and the space's function is generally reflected in its design. So we'll have dance floors, DJ booths, speaker stacks, smoking areas, uh, dark rooms, gardens, the list goes on of these kind of specific design features for the club. And the physicality of the space immediately produces this sense of physical. However, uh, these critics on site specificity that I look at kind of expand the notion of sight, and they define these two opposing views. Um, the first view, or the first notion of sight, is the literal sight. And that's kind of what I was just talking about. So the sight that relates to physical spaces. Um, the second sight, which is perhaps more complicated, is the symbolic sight, which relates to abstract or extra locational notions of sight. Um, and there's plenty to discuss and dig into about these two ideas, and there isn't so much time to go into it to too much detail. But essentially, the notion of literally site-specific works calls for work to be immovable and formal within space. Um, but this notion I find quite limited. It doesn't allow for things like site-specific performance, it doesn't allow for non-formal work or for work that sits outside of the constraints of the physical space, um, such as online work in the context of this particular project. 
Um, the symbolic sight, on the other hand, uh, recognizes the notion of sight as moving from physical to non-physical spaces. So for example, a site-specific work by this definition could take characteristics of sight that are intrinsically linked to sight and construct them outside of the physical space. So using symbols to imply a particular site or a group of sites outside of its physical location. Um, and this is something that's quite important to this idea of site making, particularly in club spaces during COVID. Um, and both literal and symbolic site are really important to this notion of site making. And this will become a bit clearer in the case studies. Um, but what I will say at this point is that when COVID-19 hit clubs in March 2020, or the closures hit clubs in March 2020, uh, regular participants lost the ability to go to physical spaces. And surrogate sites had to be created for club goers. And this has been discussed in various presentations already this weekend. So I won't, uh, this week, sorry. So I won't go too much into that. Um, but both of the notions of site specificity that I've mentioned offer options for site making. Either using the literal site, real spaces can be depicted in an online format, or new spaces can be constructed, taking signifiers from particular club spaces and reconstructing them in kind of new iterations online. Um, the second theory that I'd like to look about, look at, sorry, um, is relational practices or relational aesthetics. Um, what site specificity often misses out um, is the fact that it's intersubjectivity and people in a space that can create a site in some senses. Um, so yeah, um, while thinking about these creative strategies for site making, I looked to this idea, relational aesthetics, um, presented initially by Nicolas Bourriot in 2002. Um, and while Bourriot's case studies are maybe slightly problematic in the fact that they're quite idealistic. Um, the framework he presents is actually quite useful. And it's this idea that the exchange between individuals, their movements and their possible regulation within a space can act as the material to create form. So in combination with site specificity, this is actually a really attractive proposition in site making as more than just a space, but the amalgamation of social, political, ge potentially geographical groups as well, and the interaction between those factors. Um, and in the context of the club, we often uh, discuss the elusive vibe, and I know we're going to hear more about that later on in the afternoon, um, and how it's kind of made uh, of a combination of people and space. And I think that's a really important point, that the social groups in these spaces are critical to an event's production. They can build the space through social interactions and encoded behaviours, but also through things like dance and performance. Um, and this is kind of influenced often by the space, its reputation, and the other participants in the room in a kind of live format. So much like a work of relational aesthetics. Um, so before I quickly move on to the case studies, um, I kind of propose here that site making might involve three considerations. So firstly, it can involve the representation of the literal site. It could involve the application of notions of symbolic sites. So this idea of taking symbols from other sites and reconstructing them. Um, and the production of site based on interaction, uh, interaction between participants or intersubjectivity as Burio would call it. Um, and the case studies that I look at have not, as far as I know at least, thought about the inner workings of site specificity and relational practices and the creation of these spaces. Um, but I hope by mapping these techniques onto the case studies, their applicability will become somewhat clearer and might, demonstration, uh, sorry, might demonstrate how the consideration of these areas could influence future site making, either virtually or in person. Okay. So the first case study that I looked at was United We Stream. Um, this was launched on the 18th of March, 2020, as an almost immediate response to the 13th of March club closures across Berlin. Uh, and the organization streamed from some of the city's best known clubs, uh, as well as broadcasting from temporary events and club spaces. Um, and the format took a very literal approach to site. So streams were broadcast from the clubs themselves, 
often involved resident DJs of those clubs or affiliated artists. Other streams uh, where the club wasn't available um, took more of an approach to symbolic site. So for example, the organization's fifth stream was in collaboration with the former Berlin club Griesmüller, um, whose physical space was closed at the end of January 2020. Um, so when this was live streamed from Alte Munzer, the, uh, which is a gallery in uh, Mitte in Berlin, um, original kind of features or features of the original site uh, were reflected in the design and the curation of that night. So for example, um, the music curation was intense sort of trance-like techno, which you can often hear uh, at some of the club's former flagship events. Um, you had really intense visuals, intense strobing, um, and these really distinctive flashing X-shaped lights that could be seen in the corner of the original venue's Halle space. So what the curators here have done is they've taken these signifiers from the original site, from the literal site, but translated it into a new space and a virtual format that still implies the site of Grismula as a space. So the organization have provided in, in all of these streams that they did, be they from uh, the original club site or from new sites, um, they've provided participants with a kind of surrogate. Uh, in terms of interaction, there's little in its design that suggests the facilitation of relational practices. Um, participants viewing live could interact with viewers using a chat function, uh, but this was facilitated by Facebook. Um, it felt quite day-to-day -day and kind of built-in interaction wasn't really implied in any of the design. It was there, but it wasn't a design feature. Um, on top of that, a lot of people watching the streams live, uh, sorry, watching the streams uh, would have been doing so asynchronously. So they wouldn't have been watching live, meaning for the most part, there was no immediacy in the interaction of that space. Um, the next case study I looked at was Club Quarantine. This is or was uh, an online nightclub space which was produced by Sam Aldridge, Selam X, uh, web designer Marco Land, and a group of artists called 200 Kilograms. Um, I should say that as this research was kind of done quite early on in March, or in, early on in the pandemic, sorry, last year, uh, I've predominantly looked into the first event of Club Quarantine. And I know that now they're doing kind of in-person events, um, but this was the very first one they did. Um, and it was a one-off, unrecorded stream that was broadcast over 42 hours between the 27th and the 29th of March, 2020. And when you arrived at these websites, you were directed to this kind of virtual queue. You were asked to wait in line for about 30 seconds. Um, then you were asked by, uh, by a virtual bouncer, you were asked a number of questions, things like, have you been here before? Do you know what kind of music is playing? Uh, the kind of questions that are perhaps reminiscent of clubs across Europe with more stringent, if perhaps ambiguous, door policies. Um, at this point, you were told that you were going to be let in or that you would be rejected. Again, quite similar to some of these clubs across Europe that have these stringent, uh, strict door policies. Um, if you were rejected, you had to navigate away from the site and try again and keep on trying until you got in, presumably. Um, and these experiences are generally site specific. If we're looking at the club as a site itself, these are specific actions that club goers will experience or might have experienced in club spaces. And there's no specific reference to a single physical place, but instead the designers here have created a collage of existing spaces and brought those together into a new site. And this idea of building site becomes clearer when participants or visitors to the site uh, enter the space. Um, so the first thing you're told is that the club has a no screenshots on the dance floor policy. Um, and this is a kind of policy that was perhaps made famous by Bergheim, um, but has been adopted at clubs or events. I know that clubs like uh, Chapter 10 in London or events in London like Chapter 10, uh, Elysia in Basel, uh, Smolny in Warsaw and Bassiani in Tbilisi, these all have very similar no photos on the dance floor policy and, and they're being um, adopted as clubs begin to reopen. Um, Similarly, the designers of the space wove a sense of relationality 
between participants into Club Quarantine's design. Um, I won't go through all of these because uh, I realize I'm running out of time. Um, but one specific point of interaction was these kind of virtual toilets um, that, the, that the organizers or the designers had woven into the space. So you clicked on a, a tab that said toilets, um, or I, can't remember, I think it was toilets. Um, and you go into this kind of virtual space, and there are cubicles in front of you. And you have to wait till one becomes available. And when you go in, um, you're presented with this chat room. And it was really interesting observing how people interacted with each other in these club spaces, in these um, chat room spaces. So for example, there are a lot of conversations in that space which were asking, people were asking, um, for example, you know, where can I buy drugs? And despite the fact that people were at home and these were kind of performative conversations, it was still interesting that people were trying to mimic um, their kind of everyday conversations in that space. Okay, I'm gonna move on because I am running out of time. Um, the final case study was called Sinkers Worldwide or Sinkers.club. Um, and this was a community music platform set up by a small group of developers working in the nightlife industry in March 2020. Um, visitors to the site essentially dropped pre-mixed links, usually from SoundCloud or Mixcloud or sometimes YouTube, into the space, which were then voted on by other people in the room. Uh, the mix with the most votes um, essentially got played. Um, sorry, I was looking at the chat. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, the site also contained a live chat room and hosted a number of live DJ performances as well. Um, while very basic looking and very much like a DIY um, organization, Things Worldwide, these were guys who were just doing it um, as like a hobby. Um, they focus primarily on participant interaction and the music that they're listening to. And it kind of plays on this idea that we hear quite often about clubbing, um, that it's essentially the dancer who's selecting the soundtrack to the night, who are voting with their feet, as I think Fiona Buckland puts it. Um, there isn't very much site specific about this in terms of reconstruction of space, although signifiers of club spaces are still present. Um, but instead, it focuses primarily on collective listening, audience ownership, and relationality. OK, so just to kind of wrap up very quickly, um, the three case studies that I've kind of touched upon um, create sites to various degrees. They contain these elements of site specificity and that they've produced symbolic sites outside of the physical space. Um, but they've also created sites of interaction. Um, what they have in common is that they were built as surrogates and replacements for going out. Um, and I was going to talk a bit about where I'd like to take this in the future. So I'm not going to go into that because I have completely run out of time. Um, but what I would say is that there's a huge amount of potential in redesigning virtual sites to make physical sites more accessible. Um, part of my background is that I am an events promoter myself and a big question and kind of conversation that's come up in the last kind of couple of years with my partner who I do it with um, is how do we make these less accessible, less London centric is where we're putting on our events. Um, and I would really be interested to open up that conversation further anywhere with anyone if we can make more virtual and interactive and accessible sites post COVID when things go back to normal inverted commas. Um, I'm going to stop now. Uh, these are my references. And any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack, for this great presentation. Um, I don't know if anyone has to ask any question. The colleagues or uh, in the chat, maybe. Let's see. We have some Somebody asked a question person. about uh, gamification, which was interesting. Yes. Cesar. I, I, okay, it says Cesar Lugo Elias. Yes. Have you thought about the role of gamification in the design of these sites? Very good question. Yeah, it's it's actually not something that I that I thought about um, when I originally 
um, kind of was well, thinking about and working on this project. Um, and the kind of, it has, it's been something that's come more to light in the last kind of few months. I know that there have been a lot of nights on um, online gaming platforms like Minecraft, for example, has hosted a lot of stuff. Um, there are a few others as well. It's not something that I know a huge amount about, but I think that kind of relationship, especially with things like VR and gaming, I think could be a really interesting way to make these spaces even more interactive and even more accessible um, and kind of of a quality where they might reflect um, a real life situation or reflect the kind of quality of a physical club night or a club space. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jake. I actually ask one small question. Um, Jack, do you think that these virtual sites, this specific uh, design, can will can inspire future uh, real sites? Because now it's happening, the the the, the virtual sites are coping and replicating the the real ones. Do you think in the future, when the the real life will come back again, it can happen? Yeah, I mean, it would be it would be interesting to see uh, kind of where that goes. I think I think the potential, as as yourself and Joao were talking about earlier, this kind of potential of technologies like augmented reality within that space is kind of um, enhancing that experience. I don't see why not. I mean, you know, clubs have always been mediated by these technologies, like great sound systems, like powerful lighting rigs, incredible kind of audio visual shows, and I think. The, the possibility of virtual augmented uh, mixed realities in those spaces mm. is really fascinating. It's not an area that I know a huge amount about, but I think there is a future for it um, and one that I'd be really interested to explore. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Jake.